welcome everyone. We're very, very excited to see all of you today. It's been a little while. Um, I hope your holidays went well. I hope you're coming back rested and not less rested. I know it's been kind of a crazy one. Um, those of you who know me, I mean, we had all the things over the last five weeks. We had a COVID outbreak in our house, which was super fun. We also have a almost six week old baby. So nobody's sleeping in the shore house right now, but we're, we're very excited and excited to uh, be with all of you again today. So we're here with some really, really incredible folks about an opportunity that, that I think is really, really interesting and cool. I wish I was still in a school district so I could be working on this. In the 2020 presidential election, about 55% of eligible voters between 18 and 29 voted and participated in that election. What's crazy is that that was at the time cause for huge celebration. These were giant numbers, giant, 55%, just over half of eligible voters in that age group voted. And we were excited about that. We were excited that barely half of, uh, of, of eligible voters in that age group voted. That's a problem, right? We want change in this country. We want to see things moving forward. We want success. And for success to happen, we all need to be part of that civic process. So why is the Department of Defense covering civics? It's not necessarily a thing that I, I think that I would have thought that would be a focus area. <laughs> civics education is chronically underfunded and fails to reach underrepresented student populations. I can't speak to all of your districts. I know here in Ohio where I live, we're very, very focused on math and reading, which we should be, but at the expense a lot of times to both science and social studies and civics. Threats from misinformation and disinformation discourage and disengage young people from active citizenship. And there's enormous need, enormous need in the public sector for public service and public safety jobs. It's an untapped talent for our young people. Lack of engagement in young, uh, among young people is really, really profound. And it's not just about voting. It's lack of engagement in countless areas of public life. COVID has only exacerbated this lack of engagement with increased isolation, uh, isolation, I just made up a new word, political polarization and a general sense of apathy among many, especially our younger citizens. So how do we reverse this? How do we promote deeper engagement and a sense of civic responsibility among the youth of today? This need to understand civic responsibility is at the core of all of our work and our lives. And apathy, in fact, might be, I, man, I, I, would, I would argue probably is the biggest threat to our democracy and to all of the work that we're doing. All of the work, if you, you know, if you, uh, many of you are here from the STEM ecosystems, all of our work in STEM, in science and engineering, none of it happens if people aren't engaged. Apathy, in fact, uh, is likely the biggest threat to our democracy. The ramifications of young people failing to participate in elections is, of course, that we elect people who may not be best suited to represent them and then further alienate those young people, which then makes them less likely to vote and it just snowballs from there. Lack of engagement in other areas of life and work is equally significant consequences. Consider STEM, consider where we live, science, technology, engineering, math, these really critical things. STEM's everywhere, touches on everything. And most of all, STEM is grounded in a deep and profound connection to making the world a better place. STEM's about solving challenges, making life better and easier, securing technology for isolated areas, devising ways to ensure that our transportation systems will support our economy and producing better food. The list goes on and on about how STEM is deeply rooted in an appreciation of civics and an overall connection to the common good and welfare of our country. Our economy, our future, our democracy is grounded in a deep need for young people to embrace the challenges facing our world and planet and to use STEM to solve those challenges. STEM requires a shared sense of civic responsibility, and we're pleased to be partnering with others. We, we hear in ties and the ecosystems, we're pleased to be partnering with others to develop a pilot civics training program intended to offer high school students training in inquiry-based civic learning, media literacy education, and exploration of public service careers. We recognize the critical connection between civic engagement and STEM, and we're really, really happy to be partnering with EDC. You're going to meet some of them in just a little bit. I know that not all of you are part of an ecosystem, but for those of you who are, and we'll see a slide here in, in a second on this, for those of you who are, this is really an incredible opportunity to add value to your constituents, or even better, to build new relationships with schools in your region. Uh, the criteria, I think, um, 
I think Jessica's going to throw up this slide here in a second. Um, and the criteria, um, which we're going to see here in, there we go. There we go. Here, this is the criteria for participation in this. Any of these, any one of these, 10% enrollment of military connected students, a DODIA grantee school, a Purple Star school, or have a JROTC program. Um, this is, um, th this criteria is kind of semi-specific, but in our initial research, and we've been looking into the, um, the schools that fall under our ecosystems, and a lot, most of the ecosystems that are part of the SLECOP have at least one school district that meets this. So what a really, really great opportunity to either add value to a district you work with, or from my perspective, as somebody who works within an ecosystem, even better to bring a new district into the fold, to, to show a district the value that you can bring. So we're going to learn a lot more about this, uh, this program and this criteria as we move on. But I wanted to, to kind of start with that. Um, I mentioned this to some of you as you're filtering in. I'm going to say it again now. Down at the bottom, you have a little Q&A button. We really, really encourage you to hit that button. Ask any questions that you might have. We're going to get to as many as we can. The earlier you get that question in, the higher the likelihood it is that your question will get answered. So questions about implementation, about value, any of those types of things that you need to know in order to bring this opportunity to, to schools and districts near you or to bring it to your own school, ask those questions. Even if you don't have a question, keep your eye on that button. You'll be able to read the questions that other people are asking and give it a little thumbs up click. There's a thumbs up button, uh, which will add a vote. And if we have questions that have a lot of votes, then um, we'll be able to uh, uh, focus on those. I do see um, some people have put their hands up here and there. We'll try to get to, to some of those, but for the most part, if you could, questions in that Q&A tool, and then please keep talking within the chat and all of our panelists will be available to talk with you in the chat throughout the day. So now I'm happy to introduce Jessica Juliuson from uh, and Reagan Davenport from EDC. who will talk to us about EDC and the exciting learning initiative that we have to share with you today. Jessica is a former high school social studies teacher and expert in college and career readiness. She cultivates strategic partnerships among schools, communities, and industry to enhance outcomes for youth. Drawing on her background in whole school change, she leads innovative initiatives focused on instructional design, professional development, career, and technical education, and youth empowerment. She's the lead writer and professional development designer for EDC's Law and Justice Program and publishes on the topics of future of work, teacher development, and bridging the worlds and school of work. Jessica, um, I, I'm excited to meet you. I, I always love in this world, um, you know, I'm going to go ahead and stop the screen share real quick, or, or you can, just so we can see your face. Um, I'm always excited. You know, um, I, I think probably other people on this call are too. Uh, we have a lot of these calls with really exciting, brilliant, interesting people. But I'll be honest, it's not super common that they have a background in education. And it's always really exciting to me when they do, because it's a very, very, you know, I, I come from the school world. It's a very different perspective. So I'm curious, you know, you are a teacher. What, what brought you away from that and into this project? So it's a great question. Um, high school is still my happy place. I was a high school social studies educator. Um, and I've been in education for, gosh, more than 30 years now. Um, and I've always absolutely loved teaching that, that age of kids. And for me, what was always most important as a teacher was thinking about kind of why are we doing this? Why are we learning this? Students always asked us that. And I always felt it was really imperative for teachers to be able to answer that question. And so I kind of fell sideways out of teaching and I still plan to go back. Um, I ended up working with other teachers and doing a lot of kind of curriculum work and assessment work and then working in whole school change for a while. Um, and I will still say, while I love working with adults, kids are the most fun. Um, but I will say that uh, for me, what I think is particularly exciting is the opportunity to help kids see kind of what, what civics looks and feels like. I think a lot of times, and and I say this as a social studies teacher, it can look a lot like sort of dry dates and, you know, studying the Constitution. And it's such a living, breathing thing that I'm excited to have the chance to kind of bring it to life and help kids make those connections to their own lives. Jessica, well, I'm, I'm excited to meet you and to work with you and to learn more from you today. Uh, we also have with us Reagan Davenport. Reagan's a former educator also, 
whose work is focused on supporting educators through designing and facilitating collaborative inquiry-based professional learning opportunities grounded in best practices for establishing a high-performance learning culture that supports strong student learning outcomes. Uh, I, that was a tongue twister. Prior to her current role as curriculum professional learning specialist at EDC, she was an elementary teacher, professional development specialist, PBL and STEM Academy coach, and instructor at Wayne State University in the College of Education. Reagan, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. What about you? What, what excites and motivates you about, about this work and this project? Thanks, Jeremy. That intro made me feel like super important when you set it all together like that. But hi, everyone. My name is Reagan Davenport. Um, I am a former elementary ed teacher. Um, the high school is not my jam, um, as it is Jess's. But I think what drew me to this project is the word change, right? Like there's so much change going on right now. There is forever change going on in education. And so I um, am a parent now. I really want to instill into um, my littles um, how to be part of the change. I want them to be able to disagree with folks civilly, um, but I also want them to be um, to service of others. And so for me, this project hits all of those um, points. And we are also a military connected uh, family. My husband is a pilot in the Air Force. So that is also near and dear to my heart. So just to really help students become in, um, involved in helping others um, and to develop those civic dispositions. Reagan, uh, welcome as well. I'm excited to, to learn from you as well today. I did have uh, one question that I'm going to slightly mangle that, frankly, I meant to talk about before, which is um, uh, a question that was asked in the Q&A tool. Uh, somebody here is asking, well, you know, this guy keeps talking about STEM ecosystems. It says it in the background. What's a STEM ecosystem? It's a very, very good question. Um, we'll put a link in the chat here to the STEM Ecosystems website. This is a collaborative effort between uh, EDC and the STEM Ecosystem. So some of you here aren't part of that ecosystem initiative. The ecosystems are a really, really great initiative. There's nearly 100 ecosystems around the world, uh, most of them in the United States. Um, and those ecosystems bring together all sorts of important people. They bring schools, K-12 schools, higher education, business and industry, uh, philanthropy and, and uh, foundations, out of school time organizations, faith uh, based organizations. They bring all of these people together to discuss and decide what the regional and uh, immediate goals are that involve STEM, what the needs are that involve STEM in that region. And then they work together to pool human capital, resources, funding in order to address those goals. By design, the ecosystems you'll see as you look through that website are vastly, vastly different. Some are very hyper-local. Uh, Southern California has multiple ecosystems. Some are much larger in, in geography. Uh, the state of North Dakota is one ecosystem. There are countries with one ecosystem. Uh, some are very small. I talk, I'm outside of Cleveland. Uh, we're really near Pittsburgh. If you're from this region, you know that while we fight a lot about football, um, we're, we're kind of the same people. But Cleveland is a really small shop. Uh, two people. Um, Pittsburgh has a dozen people who work in the Pittsburgh ecosystem because by design, ecosystems are very, very separate, distinct, and designed to meet the needs of that individual community. I, in I encourage you to take a look at that website. Barb put it in the chat. There's a map there. There's a very, very good chance that there's an ecosystem near you. There's even a very good chance that you are within the geographic boundaries of an existing ecosystem. And if you are, I encourage you to uh, reach out to them, or you could even say something in the chat and some of our ecosystem folks, I know Xan is here on the call with us today, can help put you in touch with the appropriate people. It's really, really a, a rewarding and exciting opportunity regardless of your vertical, whether you're a business, a founder, a school, I'm sorry, a funder, a school, any of those types of things. All right, so we'll talk a little more about ecosystems if we need to as we go along. Again, please continue to use that Q&A tool, um, chat in the chat. And Jessica, I, I'm really excited to learn from you. So um, tell me more, tell me more about this project. 
Well, so happy to do this. And as I mentioned, you know, as an educator, I will say I'm not the smoothest with technology, but I will do my best um, with this. So, so as you heard, I mean, this is kind of a unique project. This is something, it's a unique moment in time. Um, this grant opportunity came out and we were all kind of surprised by it, quite honestly, as Jeremy mentioned, civics has been pretty chronically underfunded for a long time now. It has not been something that was really kind of on the national radar. It wasn't something that was really being promoted as a priority at the high school level. So it's been happening, but it's been happening in kind of little pockets here and there. Um, depending on your school district, depending on your state, it might be emphasized to different degrees. Um, and so when we saw this, we thought it was really exciting. Um, we saw that the Department of Defense was really actively working to promote civics. And we thought, well, why is that? Um, and as we explored, we found out they shared a lot of the same priorities and interpretations of civics that we do. And that is that basically in this time, you really can't be civically empowered in any kind of workforce area in any field, unless you kind of know how your system works and how to operate within it. Um, so we think this is a really compelling time in our democracy. So we know that young people are seeing and participating in our democracy in really new ways. And it may not be the same ways that somebody like me in my 50s might have thought of civic participation when I was younger. Um, so civic participation can look like um, engagement in social media. It, it can look like participation in a protest. It can look like working to make change in your community. All of those things are ways that people can be civically involved. Um, but so for young people right now, making up their minds about how and why they want to participate is something that is really fundamentally important. Um, and so even more, it's a time when being educated about civics doesn't just mean understanding government or how government works or you know the branches of government, although that certainly helps, um, but it also means understanding media, data, how to analyze information on all kinds of levels, um, to be able to think about context and how and why you're learning what you're learning and thinking about how you communicate and connect with other people. And as we see a lot of fragmentation happening to us, one of the things that's really most important is civil discourse and being able to connect even when you have a different person perspective from someone else. Um, so there's a lot more detail about how this will look in service specifically, but before I transition to the service project, I do want to take a moment just to acknowledge our incredible curriculum civics partner, Generation Citizen, and their project lead working with EDC is Destiny Warrior, and we're so lucky to have Destiny with us. She's a senior program manager for Generation Citizen. And she works all over the country with school districts and teachers to help them implement high quality and action-based civics education programming. So for any of you who are social studies teachers, you may already be aware of um, some of the work of Generation Citizen. Um, Destiny is the project manager for the Oklahoma City Education Research Alliance. So she does a lot of work in how you implement and scale deeper learning in public schools. And prior to that, of course, she was a middle school social studies and elementary gifted and talented teacher. And so you can tell we're all educators in one way or another, so we get the realities of the classroom uh, and everything that comes with that. Um, so Destiny, can you just take a minute and in your work, you've worked really all over the US in civics. Uh, what do you see as some of the most urgent needs in civics education and what do you think teachers really need to be keeping in mind? Yes, thank you so much. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I would say um, through our work throughout the nation, so obviously regions are different. Um, however, one thing that is very, very clear is the need for more time, specifically for civics education. In the social studies world, as we know, history and geography have, have reigned, <laughs> right? Um, but that need to elevate civics is incredibly important. And so one of the things that I would just encourage teachers to do is to really work on becoming a specialist in civics, right? Which tends to be a minor discipline in the social studies, but one that is so important important uh, and we need our students to understand. So seeking out high quality professional development and, and really giving your students the tools to be able to participate in our democracy are very, very key. So here um, on the slide that you can see, it just shows um, some of the ripple effects of action civics. Action civics, the curriculum that we work on, works with student-led projects, real-world personal issues, creating lasting systemic change, not just individual change, and then also reflection. As you can see on the slide, there are tons of ripple effects to this work um, in, in learning outcomes and project-based learning, social-emotional, 21st century skills and critical consciousness, which we're all trying to raise uh, in this day and age. So we feel um, that this is incredibly beneficial to students, but not only students, but but the communities from which they come from.
So thank you, Destiny. I just, I can't reiterate enough. If you want to check out their website, I saw that the link is in the chat. You should see some of the great work that they're doing um, just so that you can understand how excited we are to be partnering with them. Um, so that brings us to the project itself. So what is service? And um, we're always testing each other on the acronym, but you can see behind Jeremy and behind some of us that we've got it up there already. Um, so this is about supporting readiness through vital civic empowerment. And this is really something that we think um, makes our project unique. And just a little background for you. This is one of only two projects funded by the Department of Defense um, to support civics work. Um, so EDC and iCivics were the two grantees in this area. So these are both projects that the Department of Defense is pretty excited about. They think there's a lot of potential here to support their strategic plan, but also to promote some uh, of the priorities among our educating um, community, educator community. So service is basically, it's a high school project. It's a curriculum project. It's designed for teachers to be able to implement in their classrooms. And um, in just a minute, Reagan is gonna give you some of those specifics that I know you're probably hungry to hear, like how long, how many classes, what kinds of lessons, that sort of thing. But before we jump to that, I just wanted to share some of this big picture. One of the things that we think makes this particular civics curriculum project different from some of the other ones that you may have seen is that we really integrate kind of three primary components in every single module that we do. Um, and so for us, these civics, uh, modules incorporate three things. One is inquiry-based civic learning. And Destiny mentioned why the actual doing of civics is so key for us. It's not an abstract concept. It's something that they live and breathe and students will see in their everyday lives. Um, so having the chance to actually do it themselves so that they know what it looks and feels like. Um, a second key component is the media literacy education. We do not believe now that you can be civically empowered unless you are also media literate and that you understand, can analyze, access, and share media in a way that is informed and that is contextualized. And so we are excited to partner with the National uh, Association for Media Literacy Education. They are one of our partners on the project and will be contributing resources. And Reagan will tell you more about that in just a minute. Um, and the third component, and again, we think this makes us kind of different, and it's why some of you are here, because we know that you've been reached out to because you're in a career academy setting or perhaps teach in a public service, public safety pathway, um, that we really believe that civics is a career skill that civic competency is something that prepares you for workforce readiness. And so through these modules, we're gonna provide opportunities for students to really explore what some of those opportunities are to access these kinds of careers, what are some of the career opportunities they have, and to begin to develop and document some of these career skills. And we're also partnering with a contributing organization, the Law and Public Safety Education Network, who are sharing a lot of their opportunities for students to actually gain certification or make progress towards certification and advancement in a career pathway. Um, but whether you're in a career pathway or not, these are all things that your students can document and take with them um, when they leave high school. So we really think that these modules are, those three things are all essential to really prepare high school students to be active citizens and to thrive. Um, and we, by that, we mean really be able to be successful and happy in whatever work that they choose. Um, so at this point, I know you're hungry for the specifics, so I'll turn it over to Reagan to tell you a little bit more about the details. Thanks, Jess. So um, the details, the nuts and bolts, like Jess said, um, that all teachers want to know about um, and everyone that's on the call, uh, we will have uh, five modules. Uh, we've got them listed here. They will each consist of uh, 15 lessons, and we are hoping that teachers can complete them over a three-week time frame. Um, again, they are designed to engage students um, in civic opportunities in their community through service. And so the modules may be taught individually um, or in sequence. And just to note, as you see on the screen there, <clears throat> excuse me, module five is designed as that capstone experience. Um, and so we're really excited about that. Now we understand also um, that there are standards that you have to teach because you are in the classroom. And so um, we are working to align all of the uh, service curriculum to um, the C3 framework, which comes from the uh, social studies framework, the standards from that. Uh, we're also incorporating those media literacy standards. Again, Jess has mentioned that we partner It looks like Reagan might have frozen for just a moment. So 
um, I'll jump in just to say that we, uh, so we have aligned all, all of these curriculum modules to um, the C3 standards for civics and to the media literacy standards that um, namely has put together and that you will see also in several ELA standards. It's one of the reasons that we've described the projects as interdisciplinary. Um, but we're also aligning it to JROTC standards. For, so for those of you who are actually teaching in JROTC pathways, we're trying to align to the kinds of content you already have to teach rather than make it into an add-on. And I don't know if Reagan is unfrozen or not yet. I can't see her. I don't think she is quite here, Jessica, but, but while, while we're waiting for her to come back, I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, I, um, as, as many of you know, I, I worked in public schools for 16 years yeah. before uh, entering this world five or six years ago. And so uh, and most of that work was on the on the curriculum uh, and curriculum development side of the equation. Um, so I do sort of wonder, I, I mentioned in the chat that we've got, um, you know, that, that one of the biggest components of teaching STEM is teaching inquiry. And the best way to teach anything is to have it sort of across all disciplines. And you've mentioned a couple of times using inquiry in civics. And, and I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more about that. What does, what does inquiry look like under a civics lens? Uh, that is a wonderful question. And I'm actually going to turn that question over to Destiny because she's got deep expertise in this area. So I don't know, Destiny, you want to share a little more about sort of what it means to, to do inquiry in civics? Mm -hmm. I, I love that. You know, traditionally, civics has been taught as, as fact-based. And so what we do is we allow students to look around and really see what are the problems that you're facing in your community. And as they do that, we, we walk them through a civic action process on how do you actually implement change? You know, for so long, uh, I think we've just taught civics and expected that people could do civics. Um, and so this really allows students to go after that. We go through the inquiry models. Obviously there are tons of models um, that we use, but um, for this curriculum specifically, we're running through the five E's model, which is an inquiry based, um, yep, we've got it, um, an inquiry based model and we work through the civic process. So it really is fantastic for kids to look around and see what are issues, what are concerns that they have in their own community and then walk through those steps. Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. I, I'd love, I, I know, I, either later today, if we have time or, or another time to dig in a little bit more. I think this is, uh, I think that might be so far the most interesting part to me. All right. So everyone listening, here's uh, what pros the EDC folks are and their teams. We lost Reagan. Her power went out. She may not be coming back, but they're going to step in and uh, uh, fill in for her. So we appreciate that. We're going to keep on trucking. If Reagan gets back in, we will, um, we will hear from her a little bit more later. We're like a well-oiled machine. And so uh, hopefully somebody will prompt her to interrupt me. Um, and Destiny, you can certainly tag team with me if I'm not going into um, appropriate detail. But basically most teachers wanna know, so what does this look like? How would I actually fit this into what I'm already teaching? So the first response is that we're trying to design the modules for a range of grades. So if you're teaching nine through 12, um, the modules are still appropriate. And what we're hoping to do is get feedback during our first year to tell us which grades are most appropriate for which modules. But we certainly have a lot of course materials that we're drawing from to help inform us as we write the modules. So modules we're estimating to be about three weeks long um, and that we're assuming classes are about 45 minutes each. So your context may be a little different. You may have longer or shorter classes or meet less often, but that's roughly the length of a module. And so as Reagan mentioned, they can be taught individually and students will have skills embedded within each module that they can practice and demonstrate by the end of each module. If you are designing a program of study for civics that encompasses four years, you could actually teach all five modules or you could teach a civics course and teach all five together. Again, with module five intended to really be kind of a capstone where kids get to show off what they can do. Um, and as Destiny mentioned, all modules are gonna provide opportunities for students to kind of explore these essential questions in their own communities. So each module will contain a case, a central case, that students will be exploring. Um, they'll be examining some of the context and background behind each case. And then they'll be able to kind of look around in their own community and see how that applies in their own setting. And I see Reagan's back, so I'll stop talking. She's better at this than I am. Maybe I am if we stop having power outages with the sun out in Alabama. <laughs> Apologize for that. Um, I'm not sure what you covered while my power was out, Jess. So <laughs> maybe just go through the basic anatomy here because I didn't get into some of the specific components that you have in each one. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm sure Jess has been over the meat potato, the meat and the potatoes, three weeks, 45 minute sessions each. 
individually or in sequence. Module five is designed as a capstone. Um, what we're really looking to do in each of these modules is have students answer um, some essential questions. Uh, we have a component where they are focused on a specific civic action. Uh, we are going to incorporate uh, media literacy activities uh, that just talked about. Um, we're going to incorporate those career connections, um, preferably in focused on STEM. That's what's making all of this unique. We've got our standards, um, and we're actually also going to incorporate case examples or veteran profiles um, that students are able to dig deep into that will sort of guide their work through each of the uh, modules. And so, um, again, the meat and the potatoes, like, what are we doing? How are we going to do it? Um, and what does this look like for teachers? And so we know that you all have a ton um, on your educator plate um, this year, uh, past year, future, PD, all of those things. And so uh, we want to offer a pilot experience for the service curriculum that will cover your need to knows, um, that will set you up for success with your students, but that is also mindful of the time that you have available. And so what we're looking here at here is a snapshot of what the experience looks like for teachers. We're asking folks that want to be a part of this to attend a virtual orientation, uh, which is scheduled for February, where we will orient you to the curriculum um, and give you some of the information that you need to know um, to review and provide feedback on the modules. As you can see, that is a part of the year one experience as well. Um, we're hoping to do one module per month and get that feedback and implement it. And then we're going to end our, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 2022 pilot experience with having folks attend a two hour professional learning workshop uh, virtually, where you will have the uh, opportunity to engage with others around the service curriculum and work as part of a focus group. For year two, we are asking teachers to implement at least one module and provide feedback, or you can implement more. That would be awesome. Uh, we are going to offer two more virtual uh, professional learning workshops. And again, those will be focused on the best practice, um, civic action, uh, media literacy, inquiry-based learning, something around those lines. And then we're going to culminate that year two experience by preparing uh, teachers, you all, to um, get your students prepared for the student showcase, which is where they're going to um, celebrate exceptional projects that were developed in that capstone experience. And so um, again, we know that partnering with everyone is crucial um, to the success of the service curriculum. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are involving all stakeholders um, and that we are engaging with others in ways that support what's best for students um, and teachers. So Jess, do you think you could talk a little bit more about who's involved in this effort um, and why they're involved? So sure. Um, first of all, I just want to sort of clarify. So I see that there's a lot of questions kind of coming up, which we can definitely answer oh, during the okay. Q&A. Um, but I wanted to just kind of clarify that. So for year one, we're writing these modules. So we're actually in the throes of writing these modules and developing them with our partners. And we'll talk more about our partners in just a second. Um, but what we're really seeing as the role for teachers in year one, and we're looking for probably around 10 total just for that first year, is going to be to be curriculum reviewers. So you don't actually have to do anything in your classroom in year one. And um, we want to make that really clear because we know um, we are very aware of the realities of COVID and its impact on classrooms right now, and teachers have a lot on their plate. So although our original proposal had intended to start pilot this year, um, we know that that would just, this is just not the year to ask for that. And so for this year, we would have a small number of teacher reviewers, and we're hoping to have kind of a broad cross section for those of you who are in lots of different contexts, um, to read through these modules and to let us know what you think and how compelling they are and whether the standards align and how well the cases work. Um, and then in year two, that's when we would ask you to actually try them out. And so that's when um, we would ask you to, to commit to one, so one three-week module, but if you love them and can't get enough of them and want to do more, we would be thrilled. Um, and so our goal is to have as wide a cross-section as possible actually be piloting in year two. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit more of a sense of how this year would be different from the next school year. Um, 
So one of the things I just wanted to mention quickly, Reagan mentioned some of the folks that we're working with. Um, we are working with Generation Citizen, as we mentioned, and most of you are here because you know ties and their incredible uh, community uh, communities of practice and STEM networks. Um, but some others you may not be as aware of, we are working with the National Career Academy Coalition, and they are helping to really make give us a robust um, career connections and to help make sure that we're aligning to CTE standards that are relevant to these pathways. We're working with the Law and Public safety uh, network, education network, who are providing a lot of their resources for free to us to embed into these modules. And then finally, US vets, um, who are going to be helping us make sure that we are really representing the veteran perspectives and profiles and interests that are so crucial to this curriculum, and particularly to our military connected students. Um, so I know that we've taken a lot of time. So and I know, Jeremy, you probably want to leave a lot of time for Q&A. And also, I know we have one of our student advisors here with us. So um, should I stop sharing for just a second? So we can sounds, yeah, that sounds good. Time. I'd like to go to a couple of questions before we go over to Daniel. Uh, the first is, and if she's um, uh, available to, to come on, this wasn't a specific question, but Courtney, if you're there with us, um, Courtney was just asking a lot of sort of logistical questions that I think are probably on top of mind for a lot of people who are thinking about implementing. Um, Courtney, can you talk to us just real briefly about um, what you need to know in order to take the next steps here? So I'm from a school division and what I'm trying to think of, this is fantastic and thank y'all so much for um, creating this and working on it. Um, but thinking about across all subjects where this best would fit in without actually getting to like the standards and aligning. For example, you know, we've incorporated STEM kind of integrating through different subjects. Um, so it's kind of like, is it science? Is it social studies? You know, is it you know, career technical. So that's where I think I kind of need some more information to kind of help to to get those teachers then that would participate in the pilot, if that makes sense. That makes so much sense. And um, I think that's a wonderful question. And first of all, it's thrilling to hear that you're really approaching STEM from that interdisciplinary uh, approach. We just think that's that's the way real life happens. And so we, in the same vein, want to design modules that can be interdisciplinary in nature. Um, so that said, we know that most of the civic standards actually occur or are often housed in social studies or history classrooms. And so we are expecting that is probably where we will find the most uptake for uh, certainly for pilot, but maybe eventually. However, that said, it's our hope that interdisciplinary approaches can include other teachers. So you might choose to pilot this module and actually share out some of the activities with teachers in other disciplines, um, or it might be best housed in um, an ELA classroom. It really depends where you find that the civics content or even community engagement is likely to happen in your curriculum. Um, so we encourage teachers to find the fit and to see where it fits best. Um, but in terms of the actual alignment to standards, we will be providing some touch points. So for example, for ELA or for other places where there's a very logical um, connection, particularly around media literacy, that shows up in all disciplines. Um, so we will show you where those connections are so that you can use those and your teachers can have those to share with parents or other community members. Um, so that alignment will be done with each module and then teachers as they do the feedback and the piloting with us will tell us are those the right standards do they not make sense were they too hard to sort of shoehorn in if that makes sense and, and i think that um I, I think exactly that i think you're going to find throughout that uh that these educators are going to find even more connections than than you're even predicting you'll find and that's always i think a really exciting part about work like this i know we all all of us in education have been part of too many initiatives that were developed without any teacher voice. Uh, so it's really exciting that that's not the case here. I think you answered, I was gonna go in a second here to, to Charlie Gibson, but I think you just answered his question. He's asking if a class has to be STEM. It doesn't, um, you, you're, it sounds like, and I'm just repeating to confirm, you're expecting that the bulk will be in kind of that social studies civics world, but any subject area that's got the, the drive and the motivation. And I know with mm -hmm. the, the work that ties and the ecosystems have done with uh, computer science, um, that's always exciting too. So Charlie, if you know folks who are um, you know, not necessarily in this window, it's always, I think, really exciting when um, an art teacher, a music teacher, an ELA teacher, not the target audience, when some of those folks join because the perspectives that they bring is really exciting. Um, I would like to go to Richard, uh, Richard Proctor. Richard, could you ask your question? I think it's an important one. You hear me okay? I do. How are you doing, Richard? 
I'm fine. I hope you're well. Just wanted to, uh, I'm a public safety teacher and wanted to make sure that, uh, and, and with a civics background, but wanted to make sure that it could be incorporated into the public safety setting as well as trying to implement the rest of my curriculum. Absolutely. That's such a great question. And first of all, thank you for teaching in the public safety pathway. Career academies are kind of a love of mine and it's where I spent a lot of my time. Um, but yes, uh, we are, as you saw probably in our list of partners, one of our partners is the Law and Public Safety Education Network. And so they are making sure and holding our feet to the fire that we are incorporating content that, that meets the needs of that pathway. And so I would say that they're only three week modules. So it's not like a student would actually complete a module and then have a certification, but rather that they would be able to make progress towards a certification through the module work. So they could um, perhaps complete some activities or some experiences that are required for the pathway through the work of the module, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. And I'm already uh, using that network as well. And it's very good. They're great. We love Joe. He's great. He makes us do good work. He holds us accountable. Okay. And Jessica, as, as a, corollary to, uh, a corollary to Richard's question, I know that uh, as somebody who, you know, again, I've been in schools, worked in the, on the curriculum side of things a lot, I know that sometimes the issue that, that we run into is we find a dozen great programs and each of them wants 85% of the available time um, for professional development, for implementation, all of those types of things. Uh, so it's a balance that we have to figure out. Can you talk to us a little bit about the expected outlay from a, not necessarily from a training perspective, although feel free to answer that too, more from a, a classroom outlay, a student experience perspective. How much time has to be squirreled away in order to, to make this happen? Yeah, so we're, we're estimating, first of all, we feel the pain. We know, um, we know that it is not realistic to be asking teachers to sort of magically find extra time in their curriculum. So our goal is to try to create something that actually can help either support or align with something you're already doing or even replace an activity you might already have been doing. Um, the general outlay would be about three weeks. And somebody I did see in the Q&A asked the question about, could, that, could any of that be done out of school? And I think the short answer to that is yes, teachers can do this whenever and however they would like to, with the caveat that because this is pilot, um, we are going to need to know how it works in the classroom. Uh, so at least for this first kind of effort, we would need to have you trying it out in the classroom. And if it's too much time, you tell us that. And if you say you think this would work better as an out of school activity, you tell us that. Um, and that we would be able to kind of revise and revamp to make it fit better with the realistic setting that you're in. Um, the other thing just to mention is that all of this is going to be online. It will be virtual materials. So you will have those in real time. You can access both the curriculum and a, an associated teacher toolkit online on something we call uh, the RISE platform, which means that you can just click on it. You can find your materials. They can be updated. Your district and school can own those after pilot. Um, so you don't have to necessarily worry about making you know tons of copies unless you want to. So it's just a kind of very easy way to be able to access materials and for us to be able to update them in real time too. Sorry, my, my button didn't work there for a second. Uh, thank you, Jessica. That, that's perfect. And if you're listening now, I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind that right now they need teachers. So if you've got some in mind, please keep thinking about that. There's going to be an interest form that we give to you in just a, a few minutes near the end. Um, but that's really critical. If, however, you're an out of school time person, watch this space because this very well still may become an opportunity, this content for you after this pilot phase. So make sure that you stay engaged, maybe even fill out that interest form and let them know so that you know that you get those notifications. All right, we're starting to run uh, low on time. And I know that we've got a really uh, exciting final speaker that I'm excited to learn a little more about. Um, Daniel, Daniel Rue is a freshman at Regent University studying business analytics. He joined the JROTC, which apparently I should be saying JROTC as a sophomore and quickly rose through the ranks where he commanded the basic flight drill team and worked as a liaison during squadron inspections and was even a squadron commander. He earned two national awards in the program and is considering a career in the Navy after graduation. And maybe most importantly, um, he's the very first student advisor for this initiative. So Daniel, I'm hoping you can tell us a little more about uh, you uh, and what you do and, and why. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope I can get a little recording of that so I can play it every time I enter a room. Um, like you said, I am a freshman we'll put at some University. Put some hype music under it. Yeah, it'd be great. Um, right now, working on 
getting that business degree, working on getting into the Navy right now. I'm trying to go the officer candidate school route after the four-year program, um, trying to get into Navy aviation, Naval aviation and continue to pursue that route. A lot of that interest sparked in high school with that ROTC program. And I really wanted to carry that through, but I wasn't able to get in the regular ROTC program here at the college. So went OCS to do that. And, and what, Daniel, I, I'm curious about your, your you know, life experiences. What, what is it that, that funneled you towards that path to, to be looking into uh, naval aviation, to be studying business analytics? What was your path that brought you to those decisions? A lot of that was actually family-based. I am, I think, um, if I joined the Navy, it would be fourth or fifth generation Navy in my family, at least fourth generation aviator. And so a lot of that growing up around the base, growing up hearing helicopters flying over the house really pushed me, interested me spending time on base to continue to pursue that route. And in college, I was trying to find a great field, a great career field that would be really open to expansion and also something that I could kind of do alongside a career in the military. And business really opened up as one of those opportunities. It's a very flexible career path, a very useful career path. It's got a lot of implications for the future. And so I chose that because I really wanted to work for my future. I love it. My, my grandfather is in, in, the Navy, I'm sorry, in the Navy and uh, uh, he always talked about those experiences and how not only what was his experience in the Navy itself really valuable, but how well it prepared him for uh, his career path after he left the Navy. Um, so I'm really excited to, to kind of follow along that with you. And we've talked a lot, Daniel, in, in the last hour about civics, um, about the importance of civics. But I'm curious, given your experience as a graduate of the, of the Air Force uh, JROTC program, why do you think this kind of civics education is important for high school students to experience? What, what made you want to be an advisor for this program? I think a lot of that interest kind of was spurred on graduating high school, we graduated around the time of the 2020 elections and seeing a couple of my friends going out and voting, seeing people who didn't go out and vote my age that finally were eligible, uh, I began to realize kind of the disparity. The lack of civics education was really creating this problem for a lot of my peers who weren't voting or when they voted, they weren't quite sure what they were doing. And so I found a lot of the time the general attitude was, oh, it's an obligation. I have to go vote. And it's something that's like almost a chore. And I realized like, we want our students, we want our children to be growing up and looking forward to this experience, viewing this as a privilege, really getting excited to go out and vote and understand what they're voting for. America is incredible with the amount of participation that we get to have in our country's development and in our government. But a lot of the times we don't quite understand exactly what we're asking for or what we're trying to progress to. And how is that experience, um, you know, your experience, it seems like is a little bit unique, at least in some of the young people I've had an opportunity to, to interact with. Um, what about your friends in, in college and at home? Have they had similar experiences or, or do you see a, a difference in your outlook of civic engagement than, than with some of your peers? A couple of my peers, especially my peers in the honors program here at the college, we share a lot of the same views, but I found that a lot of students actually still don't share the same views. Even moving on to college, a lot of them are still a little more confused or a little unsure or shaky about exactly what they choose to believe in. And it's a little funny and a little disappointing that I'm beginning to see there's students that will group up by um, the pub uh, the public party that they would associate themselves with. And you begin to create this unnecessary division. And I've begun to see a disparity between the understanding exactly how the system works. And all of a sudden it's kind of become like rooting for a sports team. Mm -hmm. So I've noticed that there's a lot of students and when you talk to them about it, they haven't had that civics education and they weren't brought up to know or understand the problem. You know, that, that makes me think of, um, uh, of, a, of a bit I've seen, and I'm, I'm not going to get political because I've, I've seen this on both sides um, uh, of the aisle, uh, a bit I've seen a bunch where somebody will go up to a group of people at a, at, at a political rally and they'll ask about policies 
and say that those policies are the person the rallies for or the person the rallies against. And regardless of the policy, when it's for the person the rallies for, the people have a tendency to say, oh, I, I really support that. But when it's so they're making up who the who the speaker is and people aren't even really thinking about what the policy is. They're not considering it. They're just reacting based on those political associations. Um, so I, I love that that your experience is giving you an opportunity to, to really think more deeply about that. Well, thank you, Daniel. I really appreciate it. I, I can't tell you uh, the folks here in the ecosystem. know we talk about this all the time. Our ecosystem people are always saying we need more student voice. So I'm really excited that that they're. Um, that you're not only a student advisor, but I like that Jessica keeps calling you the first student advisor because that means that there will be more. Um, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of influence on not only this project, but on those other students. Uh, so stick around for these last couple of minutes in case any other questions for you pop up. Um, I do have a question, Jessica, for, for you and your team. Um, a couple of times media literacy was mentioned, but we didn't really uh, have an opportunity to, to dig into that. So since we've got a couple of minutes, I'm curious if you can talk to us a little bit about how we determine if media is credible and how we teach that skill set to, well, I, I was going to say to young people, but to, to everyone. How do we teach everyone to know um, what's credible and what isn't? And boy, I, I've lived this pain with four kids of my own and having them all come to me and say, I'm not really sure, is this a credible site? Is this a credible article? Just kind of picking up the one that has the least words. Um, I know that we've got um, Michelle on with us from Namely and uh, just want to appreciate her being here today. Um, but the short answer is that there are discrete media literacy skills. And in fact, they are already in standards that teachers are being asked to teach, but they tend to be kind of scattered all over the place. And there hasn't really been necessarily a cohesive way that students can really practice and develop them. And so for each one of these modules, um, we will be integrating specific media literacy skills that will include things like analyzing credibility of a source, um, looking at things like comparisons of websites and where they're getting their information, looking at how you support your argument with evidence, looking at things like social media um, and, and the ways that social media feeds can be sifted and things like that. Um, so each module will have a specific set of skills that they're gonna be taught and assessed and students will have the chance to practice. And so by the end of each module, they'll have something that they can demonstrate they've actually got that skill and they've actually been able to practice and become proficient in that skill. Um, and again, as I said, I think for us, it's so embedded in every discipline. And so we really feel that it's, it's essential to teach within these modules, but we would say it's also essential to continue to teach throughout all the other courses that the teachers who are here today are teaching. Um, and so, yeah, I like uh, Michelle just pointed out in the chat, there are so many questions we should be asking, um, not just if it's credible. And so helping students not just ask specific questions, but develop the skill of ask, asking questions and figuring out what questions they need to be asking. As as they analyze information. And one brief mention is that we're also going to try to include a lot of storytellers within these modules. So you'll be, they include voices of veterans, those who have served, they include voices of people in public safety careers, people who have served in other ways. And there are different perspectives that they bring to tensions and questions in our democracy. And so students will have a variety to choose from and they won't just be hearing kind of one voice. And that's a, that's a skill as well. So that's something else that's kind of a key component of our modules. Jessica, I really appreciate that. I know I asked you a question that, that really takes probably three hours to answer, and you, you did a pretty good job answering it in 90 seconds. Frankly, if we ever needed uh, another topic uh, for us all to come together, I think we could probably do a whole hour on media literacy, um, and that might be a good use of time. I'd also like to point out to everyone that in the chat, Toby just posted the interest form. Please go ahead and uh, grab that link. Open it right now. Even if you're not sure you're interested, open it right now get it saved so you've got it. It'll also be in the follow-up email that you receive when all of this is over, but get that out there. This is really a great opportunity. Again, it's a great opportunity for some educators. It's a really great opportunity if you're an ecosystem lead. It's a really great opportunity to pull some new schools into the fold or to bring value to schools that are already in the fold. And more important than any of that, it's a great opportunity to help this country and to help the young people of this country learn more about what it takes to be successful um, and to, to continue on the trajectory that we want uh, the United States of America to continue on. I'm really, really excited 
for all of this. Thank you all for learning with us. And a special thank you to Jessica, Reagan, Destiny, Daniel, and all of the EDC team. EDC would especially like to thank our partners, but particularly the Ties team. This group has been incredibly passionate and committed, and they bring integrity and quality to all the work we're doing together. Uh, they say, we appreciate Ties helping to connect this project to classroom teachers who may be excited about the same possibilities that we are. I'm excited. I think some of you are too, and I'm really excited to see how this all unfolds. Thank you all for joining us today, and we will see you next time.